Welcome to Digitally Creative. I'm your host, Vincent Ferrari, and joining me this week is my close friend who happens to be one of my favorite PC modders. He's also the only one I actually know personally, but he's still a good guy, so don't let that fool you. I have the one and only Derek Wilson from Rhodes PC. What's going on, Derek? How you doing? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. So I was telling Derek before we started recording that um, he would have been on this show when it was Because We Make, but um, our good friends over at Making Our Way beat me to it and had him on. I was scrolling through my podcast one happy Tuesday morning, and I see, like, Rhodes PC. I'm like, really? Like, holy crap. Okay, cool. Like, you do you, bro. But wow. So I was like, all right, I guess I got to wait a little bit. So the time has finally come. So welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, I... I did a little bit of time just kind of uh, reaching out and trying to spread the word of PC modding and let you guys know, you know, like waving my Instagram <laughs> hand, like, hi, I'm out here. Talk to me. Hang out with me. Well, I don't even, I think that's actually how you and I met. Like, I think you actually just kind of said you would listen to the podcast or something. And it was like, I'm looking at your stuff and I'm like, oh, wow, this stuff is awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I remember following because we make. You know, when you had Nerd Forge on, mm -hmm. uh, it was huge. And then I kind of dropped off podcasts for a while, but I got back into them once you started bringing the guys from Making Fun through mm -hmm. the show. Mm -hmm. and I think that's about when I reached out. I thought, I have to write because that was such a good episode. Actually, you know it, what? It was Justine. It was Justine. I you think had, it was Justine. You, that's right. You had, you had her on and I wrote because she said something funny that I just made a joke about, I think. <laughs> <laughs> she, um... Yeah, she was it's it's interesting because when you have some people on, you're not sure what the reaction is going to be. You know, you you know, like if I have Jimmy on, I know that 50 million people are going to come flooding through the gates like, yeah, man, Jimmy's the best. Jimmy's the best. But, you know, every once in a while you'll have someone on. You're like, I wonder what that reaction is going to be. And then you have someone like Justine on and everybody's like, oh, man, she's so great. Like, she's so much fun to listen to. She has such a good outlook. She makes such cool stuff. Like people found her YouTube channel through her being on the podcast. And it's like. Wow. I feel like that's the one good thing about podcasts is if you do stretch the boundaries a little bit and get outside your typical what your audience would typically listen to, you can ex you can kind of I don't want to say manipulate, but it is kind of manipulate who your audience is into and who they follow and what crosses their path, because you're kind of going to be like their recommendation engine. You're like a curator for interesting content creators. It's more fun that way, I think. Yeah, for sure. Like they're there for you. Whoever mm -hmm. you bring in is kind of the 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 bonus content that they get. Because I know I started going to because we make to listen to you and Brooke, right? Because it was mm -hmm. it was great hosts, fun insights. You guys would dig fun stuff out of creative people, and then it was just kind of like a a bonus as to who the guests started to become on your show. Yeah, we we got really we've gotten really lucky. I mean. I've as I've been doing this one so May it'll be four years doing this podcast wow. um and it's like sometimes I get guests and it's just like I don't even know how you know this show exists but yes you can absolutely be a guest like thank you for coming on like we had um um the guy that invented the bop it on and it's like Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was like how how of all the people in the world, like <laughs> us, this little show, and you know, but then we have people who you know we feel that way. To I keep saying we, I feel that way with some of the guests that I've had, but then there are also people who listen to our show, and when I you know they they mention their Instagram or something, I'll be like, oh yeah, I just saw you post about that, and they're like, you 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 look at my Instagram, I'm like yeah, <laughs> like it's okay, <laughs> so. You have, I love that. I love your podcast. Um, Thank you. Because you, I feel like you have a, you know, I'm not trying to say that I created a style or anything, but I feel like your podcast is very similar to the style of this one and Because We Make, where you get a guest on, but you're not like rattling off a list of Q&A stuff. You have a, um, you have more of a, like a informal conversation with them, just kind of get them talking about what interests them. And you have stories usually to share with people at that. It's exposed me to a lot of people that I didn't know existed. So um, would you tell everybody a little bit about your show and what it's about and that kind of stuff? Well, I'm glad you like it. Thanks, man. Yeah, and I really only listen to you, like, very, uh, I think, your podcast. I have Andy Pizza that I listen to all the time. He does uh, the creative pep talk. Ah, uh, okay. I knew I heard that name somewhere before. Okay, yeah, I have heard of him. 
Yeah, he's awesome. And and outside of that, uh, yeah, and all the guests I've had on so far have been, for the most part, people I've known, so it's been pretty simple to just, pretty comfortable to sit down and chat. But So I do the PC Modding and Making podcast, and if you search mm-hmm. PC Modding uh, on the podcasting you know, outlets, you'll find it. And the goal there is to kind of connect my hobby, PC modding and making, because really we do a lot of the same stuff. Like we work with tools, we work with 3D printing, there's plastics, there's acrylic work, CNC stuff. Uh, the only caveat is we tend to glue a computer to the back of it for <laughs> for fun. <laughs> but really, we're just, yeah, for really, we're just all building cool stuff. And, right. uh, so that's what I like to kind of bring on my podcast is guys who are into that sort of thing or on the making side of it and just share ideas and techniques and just talk about what we're working on. I I love, I love the way. So as someone who's 46 years old, you know, which basically means that in internet parlance, I am an old fart and I'm fine with it. But <laughs> uh, at 46 years old, I saw the, the modding thing start. You know, we went from like your traditional beige box PCs to, I remember the first thing people were doing and it was so amazing to me is when they started, the cases went from beige to black and it was like black computers. It was like, everybody was like, (laughs) you know, like, and then, yeah. And then, and then, you know, you start seeing, I had a friend who's like, you know, I have plexiglass in the garage and you start and you're like, and he's like. I'm going to cut the side out of my case and put plexiglass so I can make it like visible inside. And all of us are like, dude, you're crazy. You can't do that. (laughs) You know, and he did it. And it's funny because, you know, we look at the way we do those kinds of things now. And he was doing this with like plexiglass and caulk to hold it to the inside of the case. And now it's like, oh, no, we have we have the perfect we have five minute epoxy and we have different like riveting techniques and what ha- you know now we have rgb and now rgb controllers are actually just built into motherboards now it's like wow that e- that evolution happened fast so when did you pick up on the the modding space like at what phase was it in when you got into it it did so on all that stuff you're saying it's actually really interesting because you talk about how like people who own their computers at home decided to cut a hole in the side so that you could make your components visible but then you look at what the industry did, and it's kind of fun and interesting to see, uh, like modders and DIYers influence on manufacturers because mm-hmm. RGB controllers and tempered glass sides, those all came from people cutting their cases apart, <laughs> and then the the you know the brands just thought, hey, people want this, so they they changed their product based on what we did to them. Uh, crazy, not right? so much me; I wasn't at the very forefront, but <laughs> I I got into it. Well, I've always built computers because I've always played video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a huge World of Warcraft nerd, to be honest. Nothing wrong and with that. <laughs> I'd say 20, 2016, I built a computer that I kind of went outside the box with. I okay. I changed the side panel on it, and I also kind of... Uh, it wasn't even a mod. It was just a thing you could buy that was different. It was it was called a it's called a fan controller. So it was like this Lamptron was the oh, brand yeah. fan controller you with the knobs that the... sits in the like the drive bay in the front, and you can... yeah yeah I remember those sure <laughs> yeah. So I installed one of those in my computer, and all of a sudden my brain went, "Wow, this doesn't have to be like you know so cookie cutter. I can do kind of different things to it." So then a natural progression for modding for some people uh, is to just come from PC building, and you just start buying those kind of different types of you know things and parts to stick to your computer like you say rgb or different fans mm-hmm. uh, or the fan controller then you kind of get into I, I got into water cooling and then you kind of start running into limits and that's when modding kind of flourishes is all of a sudden <laughs> i need more space or i need a different color or something like that but my very first mod i did full scale was i i built a computer for a guy Holy, it's a it's actually a long story. Do we have time? We have as much time as we need. I mean, <laughs> obviously, I, you I I trust you to self edit. You are a podcast host, so go for yeah, it. Yeah, I'll 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 I'll, I'll kind of sum <laughs> it up. But I I was buying and building computers for people locally. Mm-hmm. This this would have been like 2016, 2017. Uh, because there was really no option where I live is kind of a smaller town. 
there's no option for people who don't know how to build a, their own computer, but they don't want to buy from Staples because that's all we have here. So I kind of started doing that <sighs> as a side hustle, and it before. worked, <laughs> and it worked great. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to learn water cooling, so I found on Instagram uh, a computer that looked awesome that was water cooled, and I ordered it from the guy. Uh, he was in my same province, and he shipped it to me. And when it showed up, the thing was like toast. Like it was wow. five thousand dollars. And the computer was like, showed up all falling apart. And uh, however, you don't ship those filled. So the, the tubes and stuff coming apart is kind of common. You would fix that when you got it. But I, I didn't sure. really know that at the time. So then I fought with this computer and the guy I had bought it from, uh, you know, he wasn't local, so he could only help so much. And what I ended up doing was just one night, it was seriously, I remember I came down from bed like in my boxers and I thought, I'm tired of this thing and I, and sitting on this investment and not getting anything out of it. I tore it all apart and I, and I built two computers from it. Oh, wow. I built, I built one that I, I put all the parts in without the water cooling stuff mm -hmm. and I sold it to a guy Well, sold, you know, hypotheses because we actually traded for his computer because I needed a computer. Okay. Uh, and the computer I got from him was this little pre-built Skytech, it's called, which is like an MATX size, so a mid to small size computer. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting on all this like extra parts and wanting of a cool computer and kind of I was a little bit upset that the one I had bought kind of didn't work out. So I turned it into a Terminator computer because I built it for myself and I've always been a big fan of the Terminator. Cool. So I, I took all this, you know, teenage angst and built a <laughs> <laughs> and built a Terminator computer. But that Terminator computer, I had no idea uh, what it would lead me to. But it also, like I post, posted it on, a, there's a Canadian form or there was a Canadian form called Daz Mode. And I posted it there and I won like build of the month. Oh, wow. And that and that's what opened my eyes to like, oh, this is a whole thing. This is like a huge thing <laughs> that tons of people do and everybody spends all their money and time doing it. I had no idea. Uh, but that is kind of the path that I went on. It's, I was just trying to become a better builder and then I ended up pumping out a Terminator build and uh, I've been addicted ever since. <laughs> it's it's so weird. I did um, the, the computer I had prior to the one I'm using now because the one I'm using now is a way over spec Dell all in one um 27 inch just monster of a of a machine that's pretty much my podcasting computer and the one i had before this i built my first computer i built it in 2018 i built it in the summer of 2018 and it was the first computer i had built for myself in oh my god it had to be about 15 years and I remember coming back into it and looking at how convenient everything is now and thinking like, wow, like the, the power supply, all the cables on the power supply were modular. And, you know, you have a tray to put the motherboard on to put it in the case rather than trying to reach into the case and put standoffs on, on the inside of the case. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And I've built PCs and I know what everything is and I'm looking at everything going, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at. Like this is, <laughs> I'm so used to it being difficult. I wasn't prepared for it to be easy. And yeah, now it's, it's like, bad. it's really not like, I love watching videos, especially, you know, all the different computer channels. They always do this every couple of years. Somebody does it. Um, I think David just did one over the summer where he had his girlfriend build a PC with just using the manual that came with the, that came with, the, it was like a, a kit. You get all the parts, and then you get a manual and tells you how to put it together. It was like from NZXT, I think. And yeah. she put the whole damn thing together, and she put like one cable backwards. The whole it's like that's amazing. Like I know what I'm doing, and I put one cable backwards. So you basically did a hundred percent. So congratulations! But it's amazing how much better the hardware has gotten for people that build their own stuff now. It's like if somebody says they can't build their own, I was like, yeah, maybe ten years ago you couldn't, but now you totally could. Now totally could. Oh yeah, I, I'm always telling people it's it's seven parts. Really, you you just get seven parts, and it's like Lego, yeah, them together for the for you know it's it's when you want to change anything or do anything kind of special, but just to do straightforward is actually super simple. Yeah, and just the other day, oh geez, I uh, I kind of uh, costed myself some money in a way because a guy messaged me saying, "Hey, my son built his own computer for Christmas." 
mm-hmm. uh, but he can't get it to work. How much do you charge for a build? And I'll drop it off and get you to build it. And I said, well, I charge this much, mm-hmm. but tell your son to text me. Like, can we text? Because uh, I was at work at the time. And uh, so I get, you know, teenagers always text the same, like, yo. And I was like, <laughs> I was, I was, I said, yo, I heard you built the computer. And he, he says, yeah, but this is not working. And then so texting this, I think he's 13, texting this 13-year-old uh, off and on over the course of three hours. I'll jump ahead. And then uh-huh. I get a text from the dad saying, I have a very happy kid. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. So I was I didn't take his I didn't charge him for the build. I just texted and the kid had it. He was one part away. He had his hard drive in the wrong uh slot on his motherboard. That was actually all it's he did. It's always wrong. something like that, by the way. It's always something like that. That's that's exactly what it always well, yeah. is. And like I figured if he bought the parts and has it mostly together, I bet you I could we could talk through this. And sure. it and it worked because it's not that bad anymore. It's really not. And most kids, I mean, most kids that are doing that know what they're doing. It's like he's he probably, you know, he hit the same thing that we as adults sometimes hit where we'll I'll I'll rip that case apart, but I'll never touch the hard drive. I'll be like, yeah. oh, I just got a dead hard drive and I'll order another one and wait for another one to show up and then plug that one in. Oh yeah, it was just a dead hard drive and throw the old one away. <laughs> but you know, yeah. it's like that's what we and, do, right? And so then texting too us. and in those texts too, I, like when the 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 father had told me you know, my son built his first computer for Christmas. Like, I didn't want to take that away from the kid. No, of course not. By taking over. Just, like, let him build his first computer. We'll just kind of sort it out. But, yeah, yeah it wasn't a big deal. There's not enough parts. There's not enough parts in a brand new machine to, to not be able to figure out what's not working. At least figure out. You may not have a part to replace it right away. You may have to wait for a replacement. You may have to send something back and get something new. That's fine. That's expected. But there's not enough going on on a new machine with new parts, it's not like the old days where it's like this doesn't work. Oh, where are your jumpers and dip switches? Like I, <laughs> most motherboards now don't even have a jumper on them at any place. It's like, again, I hate to be the get off my lawn guy. I always feel like the get off my lawn guy, but it's like you kids today, <laughs> you don't know how lucky you have it. You know, it's I, there, I enjoyed is, it though. There is a if you touch the two power buttons together, you can still jump them. Which <laughs> That's actually, true. For the first while. uh my Omni build, that's how I delivered it, was you had to jump it to start it because sure. in all the, it was, it was this giant mouse robot build that I did, uh, he's about four feet tall, mm-hmm. and we got it all together, and then by the end it was like, oh yeah, I forgot a power button. <laughs> so here I am delivering this thing to uh, the people who were going to show it up at PAX West, and they were going, how do we start it? <laughs> it was like, uh, you just use a screwdriver. I ended up getting them a power button, but... <laughs> For a minute, my like my uh, I was more comfortable with that than they they were. It was funny. Yeah, I I am when I watch what people do with computers. Same, like you you mentioned Nerd Forge earlier. What I watch with what Martina even has done with like so she just did the Switch and did their Xbox, did their PlayStation, did their PC, the Cottage piece. The was it the did she do the Cottage for the PC or the Castle? I'm trying to remember, but. Either way, I think it was the castle for the PC because I remember you doing one. You were doing bricks also that you were gonna. You got the idea from her. No, yes. Yeah, so they did the the castle was the the diorama. It was like a cottage thing. Was their PC? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, what it was. The right. Dwarven Forge. Lava yes. was their PlayStation. And it's then, wild. Uh, their their mean, Xbox just... was the garbage thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that yeah, one yeah, was yeah. cool. So the, they're all. It's all just so many like works of art. It's. I noticed that the mods have gone from let's expose the really cool components and have a lot of RGB to let's make these full blown pieces of art that just happen to have computers in them. Like even the stuff, you know, you do a little bit of both, but your pieces are just way more artistic than just cool computers. Now it's thanks, man. Well, I, I find that everybody's got a style, right? Like some guys really stick to the let's show off the components and water cooling, mm-hmm. but then it, like your style bleeds through no matter how you want to so for some people that's what's more important for me i I always kind of do like the theme and the case and the Mm -hmm. get my hands dirty with that kind (laughs) of side of things does it break your heart to see how popular laptops have become (laughs) it's a tough one you know i'll be honest (laughs) because a lot of people message and the laptop is the right choice for them sure so i'm like that, you know, they're like, do you, do you think I should buy, can I buy a mod? This is what I'm I'm looking for. Here's my use case. Uh, I walk around my shop with it and 
uh, I want to be able to travel. Can I buy a desktop? And I'm thinking, probably no, not. a laptop <laughs> is the right choice for you. And I'll be honest, I have a laptop myself, like at the CNC, I have a CNC and mm-hmm. for 3D stuff. Uh, I do design it on this desktop sometimes, but I normally use my laptop. It really wants me to figure out something cool to do with laptops. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one, though, because I even watch. So I've gotten in. I've really gotten into there's a YouTube channel called Northridge Fix. And I watch his stuff a lot. And I'm just watching the computers as they sometimes he'll show the broken down parts. Most of the time he doesn't. He just shows just the motherboard. But, you know, him and Tronics Fix, like those two guys, they're always taking stuff apart. And you watch how deep you have to go on these machines to get them apart. It's like, what would you even do with this? Like, I don't even know. Yeah. I, I I would, I've taken laptops apart. I've taken them down apart to their motherboards. And I mean, it was my former life in, in IT. Sometimes you have to take a board completely down, butt naked, take everything off it and move it to another board, like another machine. It's just the way it is. But man, just the idea of modding a laptop, just I get the heebie-jeebies from it. <laughs> I think the most I could do is paint it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I was thinking. It's like, what what else would you do? I think that's where that's where colorware really just figured something out. It's like, well, we can give people a completely unique laptop by just taking their old one and just basically powder coating it. It's like, sure. Yeah. But um so you what kind of skills what kind of skills do you employ in your in your modifications? So I know you do I know you do a lot of I'm gonna see if I can think of all of them. I know you do a lot of painting, I know you do a lot of 3D printing stuff. Um, I know you do, um, you obviously have the PC building part of it. Are there any like skills that you never thought you'd be using where you're like, oh, wow, this is kind of fun. Like this kind of fits in now. (laughs) Hmm. Dude, that's a cool question. Uh, (laughs) things I normally use. Well, I would probably say woodworking is an interesting one to find. You, You mentioned that on, you mentioned that on your podcast recently too. You were talking about how weird it is that you do so much woodworking when it comes to PC modding. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Well, yeah, it's not something I, I figured would kind of go hand in hand, but there's a lot of other stuff too, like uh, sandblasting. I've sandblasted a case. Really? Yeah. Uh, I did a Mandalorian build and we had to get it down right to the steel and to get the the nickel plating to go on it, it had to be sandblasted. Mm. So I rented wow. a little little kit. But th- yeah, there's kind of dude. You know what I just made? Chainmail. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly what you would expect a PC modern. And let me tell you, mail. that is that takes a lot longer than you yeah. expect. Yeah. I watched a video of a guy on how to make chainmail, and he held mm-hmm. up this tiny little piece like this big. Mm-hmm. Like like four inches by four inches, and he said, "Yeah, this took so, this took about ten hours." And I thought he is exaggerating. There's no way. Ten hours later, I had a four inch by four inch piece of chainmail, and I went, "He was right." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, like so, I'm trying to do a build. I can't name the theme, but he f- kills monsters, uh, where the case is inset into wood, which I picked up a piece of elm. And, you know, I've routed the, the slab to set the case into it, and I want to dress it with some chain mail to go with the uh, monster hunter guy with white hairs kind of armor. So I had to make chain mail naturally to make it uh, fit the theme. But I, I find things like that are always kind of happening per project. And I like to kind of explain it as uh, instead of kind of taking what I know and throwing it at a project, mm-hmm. I kind of pin the project to the wall and work through how how to make that happen, like what I saw. Which is probably so, a better way to approach something anyway, rather than saying, how do I cram my skills into this? It's like, what skills do I need to make this happen? It's probably a better way to look at it. Well, you're always you're always learning something new, which is definitely fun. It uh it makes you continuously learn. It it can be it's a frustrating route sometimes because you get halfway and you go like, "Holy moly, this is harder than I expected," <laughs> <laughs> or more expensive than I expected, or impossible has happened. But impossible, impossible just means I, I forgot who said it, and I I would love to give credit, but somebody once said that it's stuck in my head. Impossible just means you don't know how to do it yet. Yeah, that's like, a good way to put it. It's a really good because you will put up you, when you're in that mindset of this is not going to work. 
impossible is a very easy word to use to give yourself a get out of jail free card. Whereas if you look at it the other way, where it's just something I haven't learned how to do yet, it's more of a, oh, no, I could figure this out. I just haven't yet. Like it's it's still on now it's on you to figure it out. There is a way. There's always a way, right? There's always a way. I mean, even even Scotty with his um transparent aluminum <laughs> in 1984, yeah. he figured it out or 86. But um yeah, I'm always impressed like when you post pictures or you you you've kind of not posted as many pictures, right? You're not posting pictures as much. You're I don't know, your Instagram is are you like is there are things a little slow right now? Or are you just doing a lot of secret builds or like? Uh, it's kind of been funny. the The end of the year has been a little bit awkward because I think, you know, I, working with a lot of uh, like brands, I think that their yeah. their budget kind of resets for the new year. So oh yeah, hundred percent, a hundred. I, I I've got like six projects booked for twenty twenty three, but at the, at the end of twenty twenty two, there I had a, a Halo case that I had to do, and then just like Christmas builds, I had four regular computers to get done for people uh through christmas mm-hmm. so yeah i've been a little bit slack on the instagram quiet. side of it we'll just say quiet you've been quiet it's that time of year where you can't just show everything you're making because somebody might see it <laughs> yeah and i also have like i have five kids so christmas you is have pretty five big kids yeah dude <laughs> holy crap i had no idea <laughs> yeah so so wow. we're full yeah they're, i'm keeping them all quiet behind this door <laughs> That's I how have most sh- people do just pack them in a closet until they're <laughs> nice and quiet. <laughs> yeah, so so December was a little bit busy uh, on the family side of things wow. for that, but I did manage to get those computers done. And like the oh, I I, I got a cool uh, build booked as well that it had so much work to do uh, on the forefront, like buying tools for my shop and getting things like that in place before I could really get the job booked to mm. build the thing. That that actually kept me busy for the first half of December. Now that you have me kind of thinking in reverse, because <laughs> there's a, a game coming out March ninth, uh, I believe, is the drop. We, I have to have the build done for the fifth, and oh, the wow. idea that I proposed got accepted, and then I had to look at it like, oh man, I need a new bandsaw. I need a. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I need like you some give the idea, of... and then it's like, damn, what were you thinking, bro? What were yeah, you thinking? That, I, I kind of did that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I obviously I can't, I'm not going to ask you what you charge, but I, I I always I know what PCs generally go for, and I see the stuff you do, and I know what artists typically charge for stuff like this stuff on the level of what you're doing. And do you ever get? Do you ever go to quote something and go? No, they're not going to do this. And then somebody comes back and goes, "Yeah, no problem." Like, does you? I know your I know your prices have to be high for what you're making. You know, we'll just leave it at that. Um, when you said, "Oh, I, at least I hope they're high for what you're making," <laughs> you're, you're making me feel like they should be higher. <laughs> I, listen, I'm just going to tell you up front. No matter what you're making, everyone around you is going to tell you you're not charging enough. So don't worry about it. It just kind of comes with the territory. But do you ever give someone a quote and go, "Oof, that's just going to be an insta no," and you get the yes, and you're like, "Oh boy, now I got to figure this out." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that happens. So I, <laughs> I've from talking with like people like you and my my other people in the community, I've I haven't been charging enough uh, in the past, and I'm just starting to ramp up to that point. Good. So every build I do now, I get that feeling like you're saying, like I hand in the hey, here's the quote, and they go, okay, like, oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, here we I've are. Had that. <laughs> I've had that. I actually I did I did a full on like a whole bunch of stuff for a single wedding. Um, a lot of stuff, like a lot of different pieces for the same wedding. And then at the end, I was sitting there and I was looking at my itemized bill and I didn't bill for time. That's how that's I built for I built for materials with a multiplier. And I actually no, I did build for time. What the, one of one of the factors I didn't build for bill for. I built for X, you know, the materials with a multiplier and then I built for time with a multiplier and i came to the final number and i was like there's no way they're gonna pay they're gonna fight me this because we didn't do a quote beforehand they didn't care they just wanted the stuff done whatever i charged they were gonna pay and they kind of implied that just charge what you need to charge i just need this done so i come up with the whole invoice and i'm looking at it and i'm going there's no way in hell they're gonna pay this 
there's no way in hell they're going to pay this. And I showed it to a mutual friend. I'm like, I came up with this number. And she looks at it and she goes, that's it? I'm like, well, what do you mean that's it? I was like, this number, there's no way they're going to pay this. She goes, she goes, I'm not telling you to charge them double. But you could probably charge them double. And they'd still pay it without a problem. She goes, I don't think you're charging enough. I'm kind of annoyed with you. <laughs> and she just oh, walked wow. out of the room. And it's, you know, because the thing is, we we do we all do this as you know people that make stuff custom stuff in particular you always look at it as a customer rather than the person making the stuff and it's the worst habit to be in is to look at what you're doing as a customer rather than a producer so yeah mm-hmm. so that all that to say you're probably not charging enough i know i'm not charging enough i raised my prices on my cutting boards because wood has gotten so expensive i raised my prices on my cutting boards you know Fifteen twenty dollars, and I actually sent an email out to all my customers. I'm like, listen, if you've ever ordered a cutting board, and I've been giving you a special price because you're coming back as a customer, I was like, that's kind of got to stop. I can't afford to do it anymore. And then one of my biggest customers came back right before Christmas, and I was charging him much more than I used to charge him, and he didn't care. He just kept ordering boards. He kept me going the whole Christmas season. It's like, okay, maybe I wasn't either. I wasn't charging enough, or they just. I charged the low price when my work warranted a low price and now it warrants a little more. Like maybe You're I can charge more now. now. Was uh, that? Uh, that YouTube video about the two right before Christmas? Yeah. A, that was an awesome video. I loved it. Thank you. And B, those cutting boards were awesome. Like they Thank turned you. out really, really nice. I but... figured out I figured out how to do it. I'm I've standardized my size. They're eighteen by twelve and three quarter so that they fit through my planer. I know how many pieces of wood I need to cut. I know how many board feet I need to buy when I go to get wood now to get one board. Like I don't overbuy anymore. So my margins are better. Like that was just, that really stretched my ability to get it done. Like I was worried about every aspect of that and it still got done. It was a miracle, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I appreciate, I appreciate that. I appreciate you liked it. Cause that video was a, was a big step outside of what I would typically do for a YouTube video, like major to do oh, it as a awesome. shop vlog format. So it was awesome. I, I, I've gotten in the habit of watching Adam Savage like every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the longer and more rambly that his videos get, the better they are, you know, because he's, he's a unique person in the world. Right. So when he's rambling, you're listening to like, who, who knows what story or insights you'll pick up on. But even with you, with the, 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 you know, you took a little bit of time to let the glue sit Mm -hmm. longer than it, you know, kind of, uh, the tight bond recommended because you know that it could fall apart. And it will. <laughs> and, and, and those are the things, but those are the things that save people like me that would go to make a cutting board right? Uh, from doing that because I would read the bottle had I not watched the YouTube video and go 30 minutes, ah, okay. But it's like, wait put a it, second. <laughs> yep. Put it through the planer and all of a sudden you have chopsticks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's interesting because I I never felt compelled to make YouTube content. Like I never did. And now it's like every time I think of something I know how to do that other people don't know how to do, I'm ready to make a video. Like I have a list now of about 12 videos that I want to make. The next one is probably just going to be like um, I want to do a four time a year shop update, a four time a year. Yeah, four time a year shop update and channel update just to say what's coming and what I'm, what we're expecting for that quarter. And it's it's kind of a get out of jail free card because it's instant content. No matter what you're doing, you could do a shop update or a channel update and have content, right? But mm. then like these little videos, like these little screencasts, like the one I did for the Adobe Shasta, which to me is the coolest thing I have ever, ever, ever seen ever, you know, to just be able to fix audio with one click. Like it's just, it's fantastic. Like everyone needs to know about that. And I hadn't seen a whole lot of videos about it. I'm like, all right, well, I might as well throw mine in the ring. And people are like, I didn't even know that existed. It's like, we take, you know, and you probably get this a lot also, we take our skills for granted, right? We're like, oh, no, everybody knows how to do this. And, you know, somebody sees you do something, they go, oh, how did you do that? Wait, you don't know how to do this? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I actually do kind of find, uh, so I've put it on my website, actually, that people can just start booking calls. Uh, just well, that's cool. Minute just a 15 minute thing 
to chat about your build if you have a question because very l- good idea. Like exactly what you're saying is I found you know, I I you kind of forget the mistakes that you had to deal with to learn what we know. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So like in 20 in 2019 I did uh like like 54 builds and in 20 20 I think I had like 61 builds or something like that. And you kind of forget the tiny little things each build that gets you to where you are now with your skills. So in talking to people who are kind of newer to the platform, so when I I did the Intel Creator Challenge in October and it brought a lot of new people over to my stuff, but a lot of them hadn't followed me for those two years of falling all over the place and making a bunch of mistakes. (laughs) So I thought I'm going to add a call thing so that if people have a question that I'm forgetting to address now that I used to address, let's just talk about it. Because like you say, we we don't we take our skills for granted. And I'm not saying I have like incredible skills. I just all the little stuff I've already dealt with. Like for example, like if you're a new PC builder, uh one thing that gets overlooked a lot is if a motherboard has Wi Fi or not. Which oh, yeah. is a silly it's a silly thing. If you actually read for like four minutes, everybody will figure it out. But like everybody misses that. And then they get their computer and they go, why isn't the Wi-Fi working? And it's like, well, because Wi-Fi is on your board right? or it's not on your board. But even today, brands are still doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's absolutely brilliant because like even now, like today at this very moment, I was actually just um, one of our one of the regular listeners to this podcast was, is moving or has moved from Mac to PC. Now, I happen to know both platforms pretty well. But I'm I'm a PC guy. I used to be a big Mac guy. I am not a Mac guy anymore. I will never own another Mac. I want PCs only, period. Don't ever give me a Mac. It's not that there's anything wrong with them. They just don't work for me. Fine. But he was at he would ask questions and I'm just like, huh, that's a good question. Like, and even like now, with all the knowledge that I have and all the experience I've had with PCs over the years, I, he'll ask a question and I'll just be like, I got to look that up. You know, like he asked a a very simple question, you know, what do we think about Ryzen or about Ryzen's and laptops? And I'm like, that's a good question. Because if you asked me about desktops, I'd be like, yeah, for the most part, you could probably get by with a Ryzen on desktop and save yourself a few hundred bucks. I wouldn't, but you could. And he's like, yeah, what about the laptops? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I legitimately don't know. Like I have to look and see, have they improved enough to where they're on par? But (laughs) i know where you stand don't worry for those of you and for those of you watching the podcast you just got a nice little visual that i'm not giving away um but yeah it's kind of funny like you know somebody asked that one oddball question it's like i don't know you know do i really need blank do i really need blank and you know you have to have like i know this is probably something you'll do on those calls you have to have like a needs assessment like are you going to be doing triple a gaming or are you going to be doing like video editing like because yeah, know, so they're very huge, different needs. <laughs> and a huge one that people also forget about, and like I, I'm sorry to be nerding out on computer stuff, but it's your monitor. That's what I have you here for. You better be nerding <laughs> out, sir. <laughs> <laughs> like a huge one when people go to build a computer is let's, let's talk about your monitors. Because if we don't, yes. what are you building? You know, because people will want the best graphics card and then have like a $200 monitor. I know. I know. And, $200, no name, and slow refresh rate. And it's like, this looks terrible. It's like, yeah, it does. Yeah, so, <laughs> like, that's that's one of my main questions. Is like, what's your monitor set up like? And what are their mm-hmm. resolutions? Like, find me those model numbers. Right. And then and then it's things like budget and use case and deadline and stuff like that. But I, 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 I agree with what you're saying. There's a major tendency <laughs> to overbuy, too. And I'm going to give you a great example of people who overbought. So... The computer I'm using right now is an Inspiron 27 7700. That's what's on my desk at home. It's an i7. It's got 32 gigs in. It's got a two terabyte hard drive, 27 inch touchscreen. It's a beast. It's a really good machine. And NVIDIA, I don't remember which NVIDIA chip is in it, but it's got one of the mobile NVIDIA chips on it, which is more than adequate for what I need because I'm not playing games on this machine. At my office where I used to work, I had an i9, almost the same configuration except it only had Intel graphics, no NVIDIA. So hmm. I run. I was running Premiere at work, and I was running Premiere at home because I use Premiere a lot, and I use Illustrator a lot. Those are the two apps I use the most in the suite. And I would render a video at work, and it was 
hour and a half to render a video with an i9 and 32 gigs of RAM. And then I'd come home and I'd make a change to that video and I'd render it at home. And it, we're talking 40 minutes, 35 minutes, we're talking cutting that in almost half. Now, why? Because they overbought on the PCs at my office, but they weren't really thinking about use cases for the people that were going to use them. Like for me, I needed a GPU in that machine. Yes. You know, but if and if I had been consulting with you, you would probably go, yeah, don't use integrated graphics. Not because your average experience is going to be slow, but when you start rendering video, it's going to be five times slower. And it really makes a big difference. You can underbuy on everything else and then just jack up the graphics card to like the highest level you're able to. And you'll see excellent performance and you'll save money doing that. And that's the thing that people don't know. They think just throw money at every spec you can. It's like, oh, I can. They And they cheap out in the wrong places, basically. Yeah. Like you get some guys that will go to build their computer and they'll be like dead set that they need like 64 gigabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, okay, what are you doing? And they're like, just playing one game. I'm like, yeah. Okay. But the RAM, if we put more of that budget towards your graphics card, you're going to be happier. You know? Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the the dollar to impact ratio is very different with different things on the computer. It's like I need a lot of hard drive storage. Why? <laughs> like, well, I always ask the same question. I need two terabytes. No, you don't. No, you don't. I know you don't because I have a two terabyte NAS and it's only seventy five percent full. Like, I know you don't need that. So why do you think you need it? And you, you go through that discovery process with people when they're building a machine. It's like. Oh, you think everything just gets stored there? Yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. You're fine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's it's computers are it's it's funny cuz when you get someone the right machine and they're happy with it, that's almost a guarantee that everyone they know is going to find their way to you at some point too. Like I, I, I've right had that somebody. experience. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think it's by... I, th I think it's cuz you know you're the guy that knows stuff, so <laughs> Well, knowing stuff, and I think you probably every every maker who listening who listens to this uh, probably has the same experience that just by being easy to work with, uh, people yeah. will come back to you and appreciate. Even if you make a mistake, but you're easy to work with, sure they appreciate that, right? Yeah, I think I and I think if you're not hiding stuff from your customers either, like when you hit there's a I mean you probably in your niche you probably don't hit a lot of computer related blind spots anymore, right? But when you hit one to just acknowledge that it's a blind spot and I have to figure it out, give me some time, rather than just, you know, snowing your way through it and just letting them figure out eventually that you have no idea what you're talking about. You yeah. know? It's, I think that's the the openness and honesty with your customers. I think that's what makes all the difference. That's where you can charge your premiums for some things, you know? It it definitely amounts to that. Like and I do find computer stuff specific, just Mm -hmm. computers and the internet go so hand in hand that I can't make anything up. I get called out right away. <laughs> <laughs> the internet's ruthless for that. Have you had a customer ask you for anything where you went, wow, um, you got to give me some time on that. I just don't know. And the other qu the corollary to that question is, do customers only come to you for elaborate, crazy custom builds? Or are you doing like just nice, self-contained, well cable managed like box computers? Like, what do you generate? What's your business model look like? So it was mostly like a nice, clean, put together uh, build service at first, mm -hmm. but it's it's kind of transitioned into the more case mods or game themed kind of things. However, I still do I do both. Like for Christmas, I did four normal computers for people's kids mm -hmm. uh, just as a build service to put out but it, i kind of have to filter those because if i get a, a a bigger more extravagant project come through i have to gauge my time although those a regular build only takes a couple hours so if sure. i have time like like even today uh my 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 tax lady uh needs her son's computer rebuilt so she messaged <laughs> me and i said you know, it's a perfect time to get in your good books. Uh, I wouldn't mind if you drop off the computer on Monday. <laughs> Cause cool. For us, tax season's right around the corner, so it just it's kind of a handy. Good, yeah. Hey. Do her a favor so she doesn't mind me being a headache. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but things that have come through that have made me really think. You know, whenever people want uh, screens and sounds and 
have it incorporated into the theme. Like they're they're doable, mm-hmm. but I always worry about the upkeep on that. Like mm. if there's a screen in the computer or a boot sound that I installed, you know, in a month, will it do, still do that for you at home? Because an update would have happened, and they, you know, the other it, custom stuff always is the first to go when something like that happens. Yeah, so those are the yeah. kind of things that I'm weary of. Like, if I send something out, uh, I generally like it to not need maintenance. You know what I mean? Because I might be okay with doing it, or I understand when it needs to be done. But sure, does the client want to do that? You know, because so is that. So, what do you do about something like water cooling? Because I know that no matter how good your water cooling system is, you do have to clean it periodically. You do have to break it down periodically, flush it, and put it back together. Like. Do you have some kind of like service agreement that you have with your customers or do you just send it to them and say, hey, just in a year, you got to bring it back to me and we'll figure out what needs to be done when you bring it back for a tune up or like, how do you handle stuff like that? Yeah. So for anybody listening, like to water cool a computer, your computer has three different types of coolers, uh, a box cooler, like an air cooler, an all in one system. So that never needs servicing or a custom liquid cooled system and a custom liquid cooled system has a pump and a reservoir, a cold plate, tubes, and a radiator. So the coolant goes from your reservoir through the pump onto the cold plate, and then it goes into the radiator, and the fans dissipate heat. Uh, and you get better performance the cooler your computer is. So some people do like a liquid-cooled computer. Uh, mine is right now. But I've only sold liquid-cooled builds locally because I, I – and I do do a service agreement. So every – year and a half to two years we get we keep in touch and uh i'll service their computer for the cost of new coolant okay I'm, good i make good. them buy the coolant <laughs> but I, fair i did leave like like omni is a liquid cooled computer down at asus mm-hmm. uh but they have an understanding of it that was the only one i left behind for them to maintain you know kind of sight right. unseen probably probably safe to leave it there too <laughs> that was my hope yeah <laughs> yeah it's i'm it's the one part of i'm not gonna lie and you know i'll show my uh again i'll show my age a little bit because liquid cooling was not a thing when i started building computers way back in the late 80s but it's um it is interesting seeing how many people understand full-on liquid cooling systems now and i literally don't like i literally have no idea i if somebody said to build can you build me a liquid cool machine i'd be like <laughs> Nope. <laughs> I know a guy, but I can't. I can't do it for you. Like, I have no idea. It's one of those things that's actually, once you get into it, there's different versions of it. It's not so bad. Sure. Uh, if you do things like soft tubing, mm-hmm. uh, it's not It's not even that hard if you do rigid tubing. It just, you make a lot of mistakes when you're doing it the first time, and you kind of have to be, like, okay with that, or else you're going to get frustrated. And take the time, so I have what's, you can't see it because we're on a podcast, but there's an air tester nowadays. So you ah. can test you can test it with air before you fill it up to oh, find if idea. there's to find if there's any leaks. And I find uh that takes a lot of the scariness out of it because you used to have to just fill it up blind and hope, and hope it <laughs> hope, and hope it didn't Yeah. <laughs> Do you I know you and I both I know you and I both watch um Jay's Two Cents. Like I I think he's just a fantastic YouTube personality like he's as far as computer guy 50 50 i don't know sometimes i sometimes like dude come on man really and then sometimes i'm just like ah dude's a genius but as far as a personality and his channel i think he's one of the most entertaining channels in the pc space did you see the video where he he cleaned up his daughter's machine and he took apart the liquid cooling system that he put in her in her machine that was in her room and it was just like oh (laughs) like it was just (laughs) it was horrific so they have a hus i think they have a husky so like there was dog fur inside the machine and then there was like all this funk around all the fittings and stuff and it's just like oh you know Uh, no i I had never considered that oh it's good it's really good and i had never considered all the work that's in all the upkeep that's involved in those kinds of machines because like i said i've never had one you know the most i've ever had to do is take the side off a case and hit it with some compressed air and okay, there it is. Computer's clean, you know, but yeah, man, yeah, it's, it's wild. <laughs> they're good, but they, uh, they do take maintenance. They're kind of like a, 
a hobby in themselves to own a liquid cooled machine is yes. because you kind of want to keep that tinkering going and keep uh mm-hmm. keep taking care of it after you're done building it. It's not so much a build it and forget about it system. No. And that that's funny you say that because that was something that um on last week's episode, which as we're recording this, it's January second. So the episode that's coming out January fourth, um, Grant Alexander and I were talking about this very thing where I, I said that I respect the tinkerers a great deal because I don't have the time for it. And I respect the people who, you know, they, they build these machines or we were talking about in the, in the context of 3d printers, people who buy these like low spec, you know, Chinese manufactured 3d printers and then mod them to perfection and get them like dialed in perfectly and printing perfectly and everything's perfect with them. And it's like those people, I am not those people, but I admire those people. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had their uh, their patience. So, what um, what kind of tools are we looking at? Are we upgrading anything in the shop? I know um, you said it on your own podcast. I'm pretty sure that you're going to be, um, as the English say, you're going to be moving house at some point. Oh, that's uh, just a that's that's a work in progress. It's kind of a big <laughs> that's a big one trying to move down to uh, the U.S. Mm. and kind of align myself with a with a a much nicer and better shop than where I work from now but I did get oh the start of December what came into my I got a table saw band That's saw cool. and uh oh man I got a five and a half inch battery powered circular saw ah oh, those that little, was almost those little tiny ones well, it's a five and a half inch, so it's not the not small. Too tiny. Yeah, it's not the you. micro, but they're usually a, a seven and a half inch mm-hmm. or seven and a quarter, I think. So it's a bit smaller, but just the ha- how small it is and battery powered that makes it a really handy tool to have in the shop. That's but yeah, cool. I'm just trying to kind of build up the foundation of a <laughs> shop, you know, because yeah. I kind of I started with 3D printing and then I went from the 3D printers to a CNC. And then I had no other way to process like stock material. So I've kind of got to, I, I went the wrong way and I got to fix that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I start, no, not really. I'll tell you what, I started the first maker related thing that I had was 3D printer. It was the very first thing I had. And then I ended up, it was very funny because the second thing I got was a belt sander. And the only reason I got hmm. the, the benchtop belt sander was to clean up 3D prints. Like that's what I got it for. So that I can run a 3D print on and just smooth out the bottoms. And then I got a miter saw. And for a long time, that was my entire shop. Those three pieces, um, 3D printer, miter saw, benchtop belt sander. So yeah, the 3D printing kind of got is what got me started. So eh, I totally understand it, especially, you know, it's hard. It's with what you do, like you, you'll always need another tool. There's always going to be another thing that's like, yeah, I'm going to need to throw that in. And I'm giving you the permission slip now. It's like, there's always going to be another thing you need. It's fine. <laughs> it certainly seems to feel that way yeah right like you get started on a project like oh if i only had you know what i think i'm just gonna have to pull the trigger and buy that tool buy that tool you you do have a cnc though which is something that that's a big leap for the kind of stuff that you do that's got to make things so much easier like i can't even imagine especially if you're doing stuff out of wood to be able to just like design something and throw it out to the cnc and get a good cut and i'm sure you know you i know you can make stuff pretty with paint and cladding and whatever else you want to do with it but man it must be nice having a cnc for what you do oh yeah the precision is awesome from a cnc and the other big side of it for us is like you can make a an acrylic reservoir or like custom distribution blocks so you can make water cooling parts sure with the cnc so that that is kind of i find more people in my hobby use it for the water cooling side of things Hmm. and but it's really cool, like when you're doing your tubing for a water cooled system, you can see and see yourself a distribution block. So that would be like where the tubes plug in, uh, that the water would run through to make. But you can put, you can custom make a distribution block for anywhere in a case, so that the tubing lines up the way you want it to. Which is kind of like the a really handy part about the CNC. But I, I, you know what I find my struggle with the cnc is uh remembering to employ it as much as i should yep that's all that's always the case it's the same i do the same thing i have the cnc and i'm trying to figure out how to do templates and i had i have i had a customer 
she asked me for signage for a, a client for a wedding. And I'm like, yeah, I can, I think I have a guy that can do that. Cause I'm thinking like, okay, put the acrylic, but it won't fit in the Glowforge, right? Put it on the damn CNC. Your CNC is 30 by 30, bro. Put it on there. Like you have this gigantic machine in your shop. You know, it'll cut acrylic, right? Like, but you know, you just forget. And it's like, yeah, if I just put it on there, I can pretty much cut anything. And I go through the same thing. It's weird. We get so in the mindset of like, oh, I can cut that on the laser. That gets cut on the laser. And now it's like, oh, that's bigger than the laser. Yeah, that's why you have the CNC. Like, look the other way, the other side of the room. (laughs) (laughs) I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I mean, maybe it's just a matter of time. And I'm not trying to be the devil on your shoulder here. But I'm surprised you don't have a laser yet. Like, I figured that would be like a no brainer for you. Yeah. So I definitely want a laser. And there's a guy in town with a laser that I'm decent friends with perfect and and looking around uh like the other pc modders that i hang out with most of them have a laser and that's their kind of go-to tool Mm -hmm. uh because it's so handy and i i I understand that the light burn software is pretty easy to use it's almost idiot proof yeah and see that's perfect for me that's exactly (laughs) what i need the the cnc kind of came about as like uh there was a project that needed a cnc actually it was a project to highlight a cnc Oh, so that's even better. I, I and so I kind of I got led into buying it to make that project happen. Okay, if that makes sense, it's sure. actually kind of a cool story. But if I could go back in time, you know, and kind of redivvy the funds, I probably would have bought a laser first. I, I actually tried. I tried a laser. If I'll be fair, I bought like a a fifty watt endurance laser module in my own T track and tried to do it myself, Oof. and it was a a nightmare. And I caused a lot of fire, and I sold it. <laughs> <laughs> I did. That's how I did it, though. I had the laser. I had the, the laser was the first, um, and the laser kind of really is what. Once I got the laser moving the way I wanted to, and really understood how it worked. Figuring that out really is what changed the business for me because now I could personalize all the stuff that I make. So you you make a cutting board and it's not just a nice cutting board. Now it's a nice cutting board with your name engraved into it and not just like stamped on or painted or on the bottom or whatever, or with a sticker. And once you get into that, you start, the money starts coming in real quick. You start using it to personalize stuff. At least it did for me. And I was like, okay, well, I'll get a CNC. And I made the first mistake I ever made was getting an Inventables X Carve, which was not the right CNC for me. I'm not the guy who's going to sit there with a whole bunch of little cocaine bags putting together parts. Like, it's just not my, it's not me. That's not what I do. I need something that's almost completely assembled where I can put it together in a couple hours. So then I got the Shape Oko Double XL. And that thing has just been a rock since I got it. And I love it. Um, but yeah, the, the laser was the first just because it was the easiest thing I could think of to just go, I'll have that and that will just make things right off the bat. And I think, you know, Glowforge used to say in the instructions up and running in 25 minutes. It's true. It's really? up and running in 25 minutes. It's kind of wild, yeah. actually, that they get it to work that well. Yeah, that's sweet because like. When I ventured into the laser scene, that was where I went first. And holy, I so I bought the module. It was kind of like a friend of mine was selling off some tools mm-hmm. and he had it working. So mm-hmm. he, but he had it working with his T track and gantry system. Sure. But he was just selling the modules and kind of explained it as, oh, yeah, you'll be able to get it. So I bought it <laughs> and uh, it's 50 watts for God's sake. Like, I could never a- get it to. Change the 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 power of the laser like it was at a hundred percent power no matter what I did. <laughs> so I was like, uh, with my son in law, he's he's fourteen now. He's probably twelve then. We would uh, set something up and like, oh yeah, we're gonna cut like a little uh, axe out of this, and it was just fire instantly. Like, <laughs> it was like ah, run for it. <laughs> we were like throwing stuff out. Oh, you have crazy. to cut something, you're raining down hell on it because you're running at 50 <laughs> watts. <laughs> yeah. It was it's, funny. It, I expected that. I really, it's funny because I expected that to happen so much more than it actually did. Like, I expected, like, as soon as I got the laser, my ex wife was like, okay, there's going to be a fire extinguisher in the shop now, right? I'm like, 
I guess. Are, 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 you, are you telling me I should have a fire extinguisher? Is that is that what this conversation is? Like, yeah, there's going to be a fire extinguisher down by that thing. I'm like, okay, got it. Understood. So I bought a fire extinguisher and there was a fire extinguisher down there. And I fully expected and the only time it ever even flared. I used um, I used masking that wasn't laser safe. And it kind of, as it got warm, it peeled up a little bit. So it got close to the laser. And when the laser hit it, it ignited like basically like a candle wick. Hmm. And that was the only time I even had a flare. And it wasn't even enough to stop the glow because the Glowforge has like fire, fire sensors in it, smoke sensors in it. So if something's going wrong, it'll stop and start flashing at you. This wasn't even doing, it wasn't even enough. But to me, I was like, that's it? Like, that's the worst thing. I've, and I've had it literally December 24th. <laughs> It was four years old, December 24th. I've had that given, Google Forge for four years. And it's given you no issues. Not one. The only wow. issues are are total PEBCAC. Total PEBCAC. Which, for those of you who are not in the IT business, problem exists between keyboard and chair. <laughs> 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 and if you think about it, you realize how great that is. So when somebody says, what's the problem with this computer? Oh, it's total PEBCAC. Don't worry, I'll fix it. You don't explain what PEBCAC is, but everyone in the know just winks and nods and we all get it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I was, I don't know if I told the story on here, but long story short, I was in the middle of like a bunch of customer orders and I was on the last phase of one order and I'm like, okay, I'm almost done. I can go home. I can go home. And all of a sudden the Glowforge just stops responding. Like it won't center. It won't focus. It won't do anything. I'm like, What's the problem? So I reach in, I take the module off with the head and I'm cleaning it and I'm, you know, cleaning the connectors, blowing air in it, thinking like I just, I had been running it all day. So I'm just like, okay, it just ran it a lot and it probably got dust in it. Clean the lens, did everything, put it back on. It's not working. And I'm like, I don't understand why this isn't working. Take the module off again. Then I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't detach the cable to take this off. Like it hit me. In that moment, like I had taken it out, but I didn't detach the cable and I reach in and there's the cable just sitting in the track and I pull the cable <laughs> out and I plug the module in this time and I put it back on, turn the Glowforge on, it centers, it focuses and sitting there waiting for me. And I'm like, damn it. Okay. That's literally the only problem I've ever had. And one time the camera cable came loose, so it couldn't scan the bed. And if it can't scan the bed, it doesn't go anywhere. That was it. That's In four good. years, two cables came loose. <laughs> Jeez, like, tough life. <laughs> I know, right? First world problems. But that's why when people crap on the Glowforge, I'm like, I understand why you you, you look at its limitations. And I, I completely understand. It has its limitations, right? But it's a well-made machine. It really is. I mean, it just, for me, in the amount that I use it, I've probably overused it compared to what it's meant for. And it's I fine. Think, I think reliability is like a whole valued spreadsheet on its own when you buy something like hundred when, when, when you look at what it can do versus what it will do mm -hmm. like yeah I, my, my, I, my cnc is small but it hasn't given me problems and exactly. i appreciate that more than a big machine that would have given me problems i am having that i have that same conversation particularly with 3d printers i have a prusa i3 mark 3 and i love that printer why because like right now i can go into my into my craft room right now turn it on and print anything that's on the memory card without even thinking about it. I don't do anything to that machine. It will print right now. It'll start printing in 10 minutes. It'll start. And that reliability, knowing that I don't have to, oh, wow, is the printer going to work when I turn it on? Is it going to print? Am I going to have a pile of spaghetti? Like I've just, it just doesn't happen. And that to me, you know, and you're this, your stuff is all toward your business also. So you need that same thing. And so you can probably relate. I, I'd rather have less features, but rock solid reliability. Like that any to day. me is much more important. Yeah. Any day. Absolutely. And 3D printers is a perfect space to use that as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Because boy, they're not reliable. <laughs> not, no, not most not. of them. What do you, but, what, what are you doing 3D printer wise now? Like what do you have in your shop now? So I have a I have a Prusa Mini, <laughs> right? Good that, man. That good I man. use, and then uh, and then I have two resin printers, an any cubic, uh, mono, not the mono X though. Okay. And then I have uh, El Elagu Elgu. Okay, yeah, Elgu. Elgu yeah. Saturn S. Oh, so uh, you have which, a bigger one then? Yeah, so that's like kind of what I do the bigger stuff on, 
Gotcha. And I like that printer a lot, although lately uh, I moved it in my shop and I'm having a hard time getting it to be perfectly level again. I have or, a secret. Or something to be perfectly level in there. I have what? a secret. I what is have it? the secret. <laughs> um, I will send it to you afterwards, but there is a there is a, t- a resin table. I actually have it. I have a frozen sitting next to me now. I have a frozen Sonic Mini 8K resin printer sitting on my desk next to me right now. And the floor in my apartment is not level at any point anywhere. It's literally, it's almost like the whole thing is tipped as if water ever flowed here. It would all flow into the corner that I'm facing now with this computer. <laughs> I got a resin crafting self a resin crafting table from Amazon. And basically what it is, it's, um, it's essentially a piece of wood with four self-leveling feet and a, um, a spirit level in the middle. And I put it on the top of my desk and I dialed all the feet until the spirit level was level. And I put the frozen Sonic mini on top of it. And now the vet is completely level on it. It was never level from the day I got it. Once I got this, it's sitting up about, I don't know, inch and a half off the desk, but I don't care. Um, but this leveled it beautifully. So now it's sitting there and the vet is completely level. So that's oh, your that's solution. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, I kind of have the problem with the 3d printer for, for anybody that knows 3d printing, you know, you have your print bed. Mm-hmm. on a resin printer that that dunks into the vat and if it's on the front half or the left half of the print bed i'm pretty good it's that back right corner i can't really rely on yeah because it's, low, it's I, lower in that back right corner so everything all the resin is kind of leaning to the front of the vat basically yeah and i've tried shims and like re-leveling you know you do the the bed leveler and all that which really doesn't do much <laughs> but i've been yeah i've been kind of neglecting trying it again because it was so frustrating last week so pe- what I've seen people do, I mean, this thing I bought because I'm way too lazy to make one, but you can take like a piece of plywood and get self-leveling feet and some T-nuts and a spirit level for the middle. And you can make this that I made, uh, that I bought. You can make this for a couple of bucks worth of parts and just make a table with adjustable feet and then put the printer on top of it. And that's going to solve your problem. That'd be cool. Yeah, I'll look that up. Thanks, <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the link for this. This was great. This was like $12. And it's like, okay, so it would take me, let's say, an hour to make this, right? It's $12. I'd rather spend the $12. $12 and they, sh- and they put it in front of my apartment for free. That's a much better <laughs> deal for me. I, yeah, My time's worth more than $12. So that's how Definitely. I look at it. Um, why don't we move on to our things of the week? Because um, you have a couple for us this week. So let's uh, let's see what you brought for show and tell, Derek. <laughs> sure. So as long as it's cool, I kind of – where I work with computers and, you know, tech and everything, but I'm also in a shop mm-hmm. uh, with, like, the case for most of the time, or, like, I have a laptop at the CNC or my phone is using my go-to camera, so it's always getting dirty and I got to clean it up. Or if you have camera gear. Uh, I don't have many sponsorships. I have one sponsorship <laughs> because it's a brand that I reached out to because I like them and they kind of fit what I needed, you know, to solve a problem that I have, which is keeping all my stuff clean. So the brand Woosh, I'll hold it up if you're on camera, but the brand Woosh, mm-hmm. uh, W-H-O-O-S-H, is a tech cleaning company uh, that is completely, it, their product is non-conductive. So I can spray my computer while like my laptop while it's open and the cnc is running at the same time if i need to clean the screen up or something say it gets full of uh sawdust or something uh so i i kind of have whoosh as my first nomination for the thing of the week i will mention that i have a 15 percent discount code uh on their website you just punch in Rhodes pc and you save 15 percent. that's great and and it keep like I use it on my phone and my uh, my laptop while in the shop, uh, primarily because, you know, like for me, my laptop I only have the one, and like me and my girlfriend and the kids, we all share it. And every Oof. time I handed it back to them, it's, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> it's like covered in sawdust. That's so they'd be like, yeah. So, and then I never really was comfortable cleaning it with you know Windex or anything. So it's just a sure. microfiber cloth, but you get that little rim of sawdust around a monitor Mm -hmm. that kind of lives there and this stuff actually solves the problem and it comes with a microfiber cloth itself and like i have a video on my instagram where i walked up to my laptop while it was operating the cnc sprayed it with the big bottle of whoosh wiped it off and uh my computer didn't blow up so perfect i trust it and then 
The second cool. we'll one. have we'll have the link for that. Um, but it's whoosh.com, W H O O S H dot com. They have a whole bunch of different um the product you're showing is Screenshine, and they have a whole bunch of different um whole bunch of different sizes and packages. You could get one that has a little to go, one that you could throw in your bag and one that you keep at home. It's that's actually really cool. I might have to grab some because my cameras look like hell when I get done at the shop. So um I might have to, especially if I'm working with Paduke. Everything looks like it was dunked in a bag of Cheetos. So, <laughs> good one. Yeah. I like that. And um, it's handy. And we'll obviously... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Thanks. I was just gonna say it's handy because we do kind of go from our shops to the rest of our life, and yeah. all of our stuff is always looking like it just fought its way through the forest. Yeah. Or I mean, <laughs> and it's good. The price, the price, it's surprisingly in- inexpensive. And Derek will get a nice little little bump if you use his um, promo code. So by all means, use his promo code. Check this stuff out. I'll have the link in the show notes. So thanks. Cool. Man. What's uh, thing number two? So the thing number two. This is more. Uh, this is, will actually help you while you're building stuff. <laughs> it's. I'll hold it up to the camera. But this is a Vallejo plastic putty, and it's Ooh. just tiny, like a little tiny. Uh, it looks like a glue bottle or like a squeezer. Okay, but I used this stuff uh, recently, and it actually surprised me. So it is a plastic putty, but it's very thin, and you can apply it like with a paintbrush uh, to cover up like the lines on a model. So if I stick an arm to a torso, there's always that line, the seam line that you try and fill in with like uh, you could use glue or resin or wood filler, and they all. Yeah, and they all kind of have, you know, their pros and cons, but this plastic putty is actually made for that. And what makes it so nice is that it's so thin. Mm-hmm. So you can you can put it on your paintbrush, get it right in your seam line, and then sand it once it kind of dries. And right. I had a better experience with this than I have with like a lot of other like modeling clay or wood filler to in that use case to try and clean up your seam lines. Uh yeah, Vallejo plastic putty. That'll be my I, thing of the week. I love Vallejo stuff so much. Vallejo and Tim, and Tamia. Those if you like I am addicted. I've been By the way, I'm going to put this out on the podcast cuz I've not thought to do it so far. I'm a going to get a tube of that stuff because when you're putting pieces for 3D prints together, there's always a, a seam that you can never quite get filled in. I've been using um the green body filler from 3M, yeah. the green spot putty. That stuff works great, but it's so it stinks. Like I would never, I wouldn't even use it in my apartment because my neighbors upstairs are going to lose their minds if they start smelling <laughs> that stuff in my apartment. So I can't even use it here. I have to use it in my shop, which is a whole other. Anyway, but Tamiya makes a fine surface primer that is absolutely the best primer I have ever used on anything ever. And I wow. don't know why, but it does seem like there is some kind of global shortage of it. Nobody has it. And when they do have it, it's like I've seen it as high as $28 for the small cans, which is outrageous because I paid like 6 for the can that I have. But the can that I have is almost empty. And I'm really being – I'm really conserving it. In fact, um, Steve Casino, who makes the – for those of you who follow him on Instagram, you know him as the guy that paints peanuts – he um he recommended clear gesso and use that as a primer instead of the surface primer if I can't get the surface primer. And I did buy a bottle of it. I just haven't tried it yet. But if anyone knows where to get the Tamiya fine surface primer, either gray or white, please let me know. And if it's local to you and you get it, I will give you money. Just get me some. Please, please get me some. I am almost out and I can't find it at a reasonable price anywhere. Okay. <laughs> it's like an <laughs> SOS. Awesome. The, the clear... Clear gesso is a, that's a good recommendation. I, I have white and black. I don't have clear. Yeah. So he recommended because he was showing something. We were chatting about. I actually asked him. I was like, "Hey," because he was using Tamiya paints on something. I'm like, "Hey, if you use Tamiya stuff, do you use the fine surface primer? Because it's really good. It's it's fantastic. It dries super fast, and it looks excellent. It makes a great. It gives whatever you're painting on gives a great bite. Like it's it's a perfect primer. You can't get it." And you can't get it reasonably. So even like I check Blick, which if you can't get it at Blick, it's like it's really out everywhere. But Blick doesn't have it. Um, Hobby Lobby is where I got the last can that I bought. They don't have it anymore. Michaels doesn't have it. And they have all the other Tamiya stuff. So I don't even know. So, yeah, this is my begging call. If you have it or if you see it, 
particularly the white one, but I'll settle for the gray. Just pick up a can and let me know. I'll pay you for it. Um, don't all do it at once, though, because I can't afford all of it. <laughs> I don't need 60 cans of it. Co- coordinate first. But um, <laughs> my thing of the week this week, um, my thing of the week this week is something that streamers have known about for a long time. Um, and it's a thing that's not new, but it's new to me. I just got it. And it's the Elgato Stream Deck. And for those of you that have been paying attention to what I've been up to the last couple of weeks, you may have noticed I've been doing a lot more YouTube content, which I wasn't doing any. Now I'm doing about a video a week. Sometimes last, like last week, I did two videos in a week. One of the things I've been enjoying doing is showing people how to do stuff on screen. And the nice thing about that is I do everything with OBS. So I set up all my different configurations for different screens, and then I can switch between them. Well, if you're using OBS on a computer, you have to click on the mouse and move over to change screens. With the Stream Deck, basically what it is, it's a, somebody called it a macro keyboard, which is actually a really good way to define it, but it's every little screen. It's got, mine has 15 little LCDs on it, and every little LCD is a programmable screen and a button, and you can label it with whatever you want, through the software and make the button do whatever you want it to do. So I have a couple set up for OBS that I can switch scenes just by hitting a button without having to go into the OBS interface. It's absolutely fantastic. This is the regular cheap base model, but it's readily available right now. And it's, I think I paid $49 for it. Like it's nothing. The other cool thing is there are add-ons that'll let it work with like Adobe Premiere. So you can use it as a macro keyboard for like desktop apps too, not just for streaming and broadcasting. So I don't have that set up because I don't really need that. But that's just another thing you could do with it in case you don't do OBS type streaming or screen recording. So it's the Elgato Stream Deck. I will have a link to it in the show notes in case you want to get one of your own. Um, time we probably should thank the people that support the show financially. Those people include Matthew Serio from Artigiano Serio, Big Al Schultz of New York Woodworks, Tori Decker of Tori Did It, Ed Swanson of Ed's Clocks and More, Jake Drews of Make With Jake, Megan Chris from Onyx Designs Woodwork, Christian Neary of Warren Works, Jeff Stein, a.k.a. A Weird Guy, Kim and Garrett of Kim and Garrett Make It, Rory Langefeld of RLL Woodworks and DIY, Robert J. Keller, Robert J. Keller Rebecca Cole of Beck C Designs, Brian Arsenault of the Seven Hills Maker, Lars Coleman of Colorado Multicraft, Dave Bauer of Dave Bauer Art, Jeremy Spies, Mike of Pixels to Prototype, Donald LeBlanc of Fun with Woodworking, and the one and only Grant Alexander from the Clamp Podcast. Those are the people that support this show financially, and I thank them tremendously for that. But if you can't support the show financially, then you can leave a review or share the show, and that helps just as much. And in fact, this week, I have a review. And that review is from, oh God, I can't read the name because it printed in gray. No, don't do this to me. (laughs) Tapnappers. That's the name they went by on Apple Podcasts. So thank you, Tapnappers. Five stars. Well done. Just listened to my first episode, and I was very impressed with the smooth flow of conversation. The next line is, of course, the money shot. Vincent is very well-spoken and engaging, facilitated a great rapport with his guest. Well, thank you, Tapnappers. I really appreciate that. And if you have a moment, please drop by wherever you listen to this podcast and leave a review. Um, it definitely helps people find the podcast, and it helps when I send it out to someone and say, hey, do you want to come on my show? And they look at the reviews, and the reviews are five stars. Five stars makes me look real good, and it convinces people that this is a legit operation over here even though we all know the truth. <laughs> Derek, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, man. I it's like I said, I wish we could have gotten you on sooner, but I wanted to give I wanted to give you a little breathing room, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you on podcasts and just overexpose you, but now see now, boom, right at the beginning of the year, first guest on the podcast in the new year. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. I really appreciate it and uh I'm happy to chat anytime. Um we have I want if you guys are looking for, if you guys are looking for um, advice on buying a new PC, I would highly recommend checking with Derek, going through his discovery call process. Um, I'm assuming, and I want to make sure that we have what you do with this straight. They don't necessarily end up having to buy a computer. For, it would be nice if they did, obviously, but you're consult, you're willing to talk to people, just help them figure out what they need and stuff like that, right? Yeah, it's just a uh, you do it yourself. 
give me a call. We'll kind of go over what you're working with or what your okay. goals are. And if you wanted to go further and actually mod the computer, then we, because I, I want to use that as a way to, you know, help, but also give you, cause you can go on YouTube and look up, you know, a modding tutorial or what you can do, but I want it to be like with your exact stuff. Sure. You know, how, let's talk about that. Yeah, you're going to get a, a level of personalization, plus he's Canadian, so he's nice. And that, that just goes to show. I mean, he's even got the really cool Canadian accent, so he's a legit Canadian with a Canadian accent. So he even says garage weird. So it's it's right. all it's, <laughs> it's the one thing it's the one thing on your podcast every once in a while you'll say the word garage and it just like it's like nails on a chalkboard for me the way you say it. There's some you got a weird accent the way you say it. Like you call well, it a garage. Say it now. Go ahead. Garage. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah, no, no. But it's other than that, no. Derek, Derek's a good dude, and he's definitely willing to help you either build your own or he's willing to build one for you if you got the bucks for it. And um, when you see some of the stuff he's made, you should definitely check out his Instagram. But when you see some of the stuff he's made, you're probably going to want him to build one for you also, because God, dude, the stuff you build is just spectacular. It's, Thank you. It's so cool seeing you just expanding your presence, doing the podcast, and it's 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 good, man. It's it's nice watching you grow, and it's nice watching the response to your stuff being what it is. I'm happy for you. I'm even happy that your trauma at the Intel build off kind of worked out. That was a hell of an episode. If you want to listen to an episode of his PC modding and making podcast, that's a damn good place to start. Is that episode? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I've listened to ever since you told me about the show, not gonna lie, ever since you told me about the show, I have not missed an episode. So I'm really happy for you and I'm happy it's going well. Is there, aside from, um, aside from your website and the podcast, is there any, and Instagram, is there any place else that people should look out for your stuff? Well, on all social medias, it's, uh, it's Rhodes PC, Okay, uh, but I'm definitely the most active on Instagram. Okay, great. Um, I'll I'll have all his links. I'll have all his links in the show notes so that you can find Derek wherever you need your dose of Derek. So there you go. There's your marketing. Wherever you need a dose of Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All man. right. Thank you so much for joining me, Derek. And thank you for listening. I will be back again next week. The guests already lined up, so I'm probably going to be recording this week. And uh, I'll chat with you then. Until then, have a great week, everybody. See you.